when I told my wife Carol that I was having trouble coming up with a story on, on this theme and I really felt like I should be able to, the theme of media, she said, well, what about your all-time favorite movie, Little Big Man? Well, what's the story in that? Well, you know, the way your life is so similar to, to the character in that. Well, that was a spoof on old westerns. How, <laughs> how is my life similar to that? And she said, well, the way you've lived in two different worlds. And I saw what she was getting at. I understood. Now, if, you're, if you don't remember the movie, and it was a long time ago. It was a 1970 movie based on a 1964 book by Thomas Berger. It was an um, early counterculture book and an early counterculture movie. Dustin Hoffman played Jack Crabb. Uh, in the movie, he's 121 years old, and he, he talks about his early life in the Old West as a, as a small boy with his family traveling west. They get um, surrounded by Indians. He's pulled off. He's, he's kidnapped by the Indians, Cheyenne Indians. And he grows up among them. And he has a pretty you know, reasonable, he's comfortable there, has a reasonable life there. They give him the name, Little Big Man. And when he's about 16, he's out with some braves. And they get, they get surrounded by soldiers uh, with a knife to his throat. To save his skin, he calls out, God bless my mother. God bless George Washington. Can't you see I'm white? And he, he saves his skin that way. And he goes to live in the white world where he runs into a lot of hypocrisy. And there's, there are plot twists that take him back and forth between the white world and the Indian world. White world, there's always a fair amount of hypocrisy. Indian world, there's a kind of a live and let live culture. And he, he marries an Indian woman, they have a baby, and then that woman and the baby are, are killed in an in a army massacre. And he's bitter for a while, but then he, he sees his opportunity to get revenge in the form of George Armstrong Custer, who in the movie is presented as really stupid and really arrogant. And uh, the, the Dustin Hoffman character, Jack Crabb, has the opportunity to, to, to encourage Custer to Little Bighorn and, and his last stand. Now, what does that have to do with me? Well, in 1964, the same year that the book came out, I started college, and I was kidnapped. I was kidnapped by pot-smoking, kumbaya singing, any war protesters. And who we, I would later become what was, what was then to be called a hippie. And, and yes, it's true that my hair grew so long that it just eventually, just out of its weight, it just kind of <laughs> pulled out of my skull. <laughs> and you know, and, and I had grown up in the 50s, and you know, you, that, that was sort of the John Wayne uh, era of America always does everything right, we never do anything wrong, God's on our side. And you know, it was a shock to, to learn about the Vietnam War I didn't, without any clear explanation of what we're doing there, to get exposed to, to what was going on in, in civil rights. And by the end of the decade of the 1960s, I spent an afternoon in a living room in um, Washington uh, with Jane Fonda uh, discussing uh, Nixon's invasion of Cambodia, my good friend Brian's fast in Lafayette Square against the invasion of Cambodia, and her, her latest picture about marathon dancing. But I had to save my skin, too, i.e., I had to make a living. So in seven years, I went from that spending an afternoon with Jane Fonda to spending a morning in Kennedy Center having breakfast with Margaret Thatcher and discussing the benefits of capitalism and, and multinational corporations. I was then a 
public relations executive for Mobile Oil. <laughs> so at Mobile, I certainly saw my share of, of hypoc corporate hypocrisy, the way Jack Crabb had, had seen that in the white world. But Mobile, at least at that time, before it was bought by Exxon, understood that it needed to maintain its credibility. I mean, I was hired to tell its story in the best way possible, but I was never asked to lie. I was never asked to mislead. They understood the, the, that, that they needed their, their credibility. But they kicked me out after about 20 years in one of those, in one of those purges. And I, I was now an expert in doing PR for companies that everybody hates. So I ended up in, in 2000 becoming the Director of Communications and State Government Relations for the trade association that represented the traded wood, associ uh, the traded wood industry, uh, treated wood industry in the United States. And at that time, everybody was learning to hate it because the, the media, the public, the regulators, the legislators were becoming conscious of the fact that the chemical used to treat the wood that goes into decks, docks, play sets, utility poles, fences, play sets, uh, contains arsenic, or, or, or at the time contained arsenic. And if I said to them, and th th this was a, a stormy relationship. This was my General George Armstrong Custard. These were some of the stupidest and most arrogant business people I had ever run into. And if I said to them, hey, you know, eh, play sets are only 2% are only two percent of your business, uh, why don't you use another chemical for, for, for play sets so we don't have all those news stories about the little two-year-olds crawling around on, on, on the stuff with arsenic in it? And so oh, we, we couldn't do that. That would be like uh, admitting there was something wrong with our product. It would be like admitting there was something wrong with arsenic. <laughs> and there were a lot of times when I had to draw a line in the sand and say, basically, I'm here to tell your story the best way possible. And that's by telling the truth. So I'm willing to say this. I'm not willing to say that. And if you want me to say that, you got to fire me. And you know, I, I did hundreds, literally hundreds, of television, radio, newspaper interviews, and managed to go by my own standards. I, I knew that they weren't going to fire me. They couldn't really afford to, at that time, fire their spokesperson. So finally, a Republican appointee at the EPA calls in the heads of that industry to a private meeting and basically says, I want to tell you only two words, children and arsenic. And because you people are so dumb that you haven't fixed that, you're going to voluntarily stop using that preservative for all residential uses. You're going to do this voluntarily because if you don't, I'm going to start a rulemaking that will take seven years and will make your life miserable for seven years, and then I'll win anyway. So the industry voluntarily stopped using chromated cop copper arsenate, arsenate as the preservative for residential uses. And my last act with that industry, that industry was about to implode, the trade association would implode, my job would implode, but my last act there was to fight over how we were going to express this voluntary decision because somehow they wanted to say it was based on um, consumer choice, which was a hard one to understand. So anyway, we, we, we negotiated that. I, I made the announcement for them. The, the industry fell apart. My job fell apart. And now I'm in an industry that everybody loves. I'm an insurance agent. <laughs> but in a sense, you could say that my two worlds have melded in, in my current job because, yes, on one hand, I've got to deal with the corporate structure with the, with the insurance carriers, 
But on the other hand, I run my own business, I treat my employees, my, my customers, by my standards and, and by the ethics that I think are right. And it, I've realized now in, in thinking about this story and telling this story that I have to start a new custom at work. When we have staff meetings, we're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. 